Okay, thanks very much for that. Um, all right, I'm continuing to say that's okay. Right, um, it's good to be with everybody today, albeit virtually, so it's very strange, but I'm sure we'll, we'll, cope, down, uh, we'll cope with it. So um, I'm going to talk about a project that started very unusually. So a little over two years ago now, I received an email from Dr. Sarah Jones, who owns and manages Full Circle Funerals. Um, this is a small funeral director company that, that operates um, around Yorkshire. Um, Sarah's a funeral director now, but she used to be a healthcare professional. And um, the email asked what seemed to be a very simple question, which was, is it possible to measure the impact of funerals on well-being over time? Now, that seems a really simple question, but it's not really a very easy question to answer. My first response to the question was, well, it depends on what you mean by funerals, because funerals are so many things. They're rituals and processes, their actions and their purchases. So for a start, what we needed to know was what exactly about funerals was so important that getting it right or getting it wrong might carry, carry long term detrimental impacts. So there was no way of answering this question by using existing secondary literature. And so we decided to find out for ourselves what makes funerals meaningful. And we thought we decided the best way to find out was to ask experts. We asked people who'd experienced funerals to ask them how they'd found meaning in those funerals. So the study I'm going to talk about today is based on 50 Right, so what makes meaning, uh, funerals meaningful? So I'm not going to talk about the research method in any great detail. Um, you can see at the bottom of the screen there, that's a reference to the report, and that's freely available to anybody who wants to download it. But what you can see from this next slide that I'm... Um, going on to is um, that the, respond the majority of respondents that we spoke to had themselves arranged a funeral or arranged it alongside another family member. The majority of people we talked to were talking about the funeral of a parent or a grandparent. And we wanted a mix of different kinds of responses. So we also included um, a small number of people who'd simply attended a funeral or participated in a funeral. Um, so that was kind of interesting as well to us to sort of listen to their accounts. 21 of the funerals that I'm going to talk about today took place within the last two years and a further 10 between five and 10 years ago. Now, we were really happy to talk to people who'd had, who were willing to talk about a funeral that, that long ago because um, it was important, I think, to understand what people remembered from that long time ago, what stuck in their minds as being important. So even though seven people were talking about funerals that were over 11 years old, they really had important things to say about those. So um, before going on again to talk about funerals in detail, this is a kind of mixture of types of funeral that we were talking about. Um, the majority of the funerals were, as you might anticipate, were cremations at the local crematorium. Um, a good number of them included some kind of uh, ritual um, religious service. Um, there were some interments taking place at a green burial site. One interesting cremation plus interment at green burial site, which was quite unusual. Um, and some churchyard burials as well. So quite a mix. And also for very complicated kind of days or, or two or three day events that had separate memorial services and um, burials or cremations where there were two or three events happening one after another. It was really important to us that people talked about a funeral they wanted to talk about and they, that, that they could remember. Um, so we didn't ask people to talk about a particularly bad funeral or a particularly good funeral. It was just a funeral they wanted to talk about um, and, and it was interesting for us to to arrive at what fairly typical experiences not extremes one way or another so I think by the time we'd finished our interviewing we felt that we'd got a really good kind of group of um, interviews that reflected pretty typical experience albeit most of the people that we talked to were white and it was very kind of restricted in ethnicity um, we decided quite early on that we had to sort of roll with that aspect of the research because um, it, it's very hard to do purposeful um, um, recruitment, but we can talk about that perhaps afterwards. 
So in this talk today, I want to do three things. I want to first talk about the boundaries of funeral activity. I want to talk about the five funeral, what we call the funeral factors, the five things about the funeral that were thought to be important by the people that we interviewed. And then I want to sort of summarise by talking about some key messages. First, sort of thinking about the boundaries of funeral activity. And this is really interesting to me. Um, before doing this research, I hadn't done a great deal of research on funerals. But one thing that I decided quite early on is that we would, we would be pretty flexible how we defined that. Um, often when we talk about funerals, we're generally just thinking about that kind of 40 minute time slot we get at the crematorium. And certainly we're going to talk about that 40 minutes, um, but we're going to talk about quite a lot of other things as well, um, not just the element of the funeral. Our research demonstrated the funeral service is actually part of a really extended range of funeral activities and satisfaction with that 40 minute, with that 40 minute service really depended on a lot of other things that were happening around the service itself. So in this report, the, the, the notion of a funeral follows this kind of very extended timeline um, and we've, we've put in here the, the, the following kind of key events and processes. These events and processes and actions kind of merge one into another, don't always follow the same trajectory, but every funeral that we talked about in the study kind of like we questioned people on each of these kind of elements. So I'm going to go through each of these kind of one at a time. I think the first thing was discussion of funeral wishes. Now, these can take place at any time in a person's life and is often provoked by a death. Um, and we'll go and talk about this in great detail um, a bit later in the presentation, that where funeral wishes hadn't been talked about or discussed, then the absence of wishes could frame the funeral. It's a loss that's actively felt. The death itself was really important. We talked to people, um, we started the conversation with people talking about family just generally, and then people were invited to talk about the death and people gave us sometimes quite extended narratives around the death of the person um, that whose funeral they were talking about. And that narrative was really in itself very rich and it was really detailed in, in kind of setting that scene for understanding what the funeral service was then sort of think was, was kind of intended to sort of deal with. We have an idea that, um, I mean, most of the people who were talking about death were talking about death in hospital. And we have an idea often that death in the hospital can be a very lonely thing. But we were surprised at um, how many people were with the person who died when they died. Um, this was something that was of great comfort to the families. And it was really kind of important in understanding that people started their funeral narrative at that point, at that moment of death, when people were with that person at that point in time. I think um, not all deaths were in hospital. Some deaths were very sudden. Some deaths were remarkably traumatic. And so, you know, understanding the importance that was attached to the funeral really has to sort of be placed in that context. I think the next kind of tranche of things that happen are kind of first and subsequent meetings with the funeral director. And that first one or two meetings kind of sets out what the kind of like, what the funeral service is gonna be doing, what it kind of looks like. There's choices, opportunities kind of framed around what, what decisions are being made by the family there um, before, during and after the funeral service. So that's the point at which decisions are, begin to be articulated about that day. The other thing that we talked about with people was, was family decision making and how decisions were arrived at um, when it came to the funeral. And that, that the impact and, of family is really important in our understanding of funerals. Often when we talk about, particularly when we talk about people buying funerals, uh, we often are thinking about an individual who's very isolated and very distressed and, and um, very vulnerable. But for the most part, people said funerals were very much family decisions. There was a lot of family decision making going on in terms of what was happening and a lot of kind of divvying out of different kinds of activities, actions and tasks so that people could be involved in the funeral. So it was kind of very much a family event and understanding the family dynamic is really important to understanding the funeral. And that kind of leads to this next point about emotional labour. Because those sometimes, usually about two weeks between the death and the funeral, was often very busy for people in preparing for the funeral service and preparing what they wanted to do at the funeral service and in, in thinking about 
music and flowers and thinking about whether to visit the body, all of these things, these decisions that had to be made, people saw that as emotional labor. It's something that actually was ritualized activity that really fed into how they felt about the funeral overall. Um, and I don't think we'd really anticipated how important this emotional labor is to people's satisfaction in the funeral. And I'll revisit that again later. There is a point, um, and I'll talk about this in detail as well later, where people might choose to go and visit the body or visit with the body. That can happen at various uh, points after the death. And understanding how people dealt with that aspect of the funeral is, again, a really big part of thinking about what's important about um, the funeral. The funeral service itself that takes place often just within the confines of the day, you know, what happens before the service, those, those times and what happens afterwards. Um, really complicated event. We talked people through that event in a huge amount of detail. We, we talked about the kind of tangible elements, you know, about the cars, about the coffins, flowers, the intangible elements. We talked about music and performance and the deliver of the eulogy, any kind of actions and things that happened. And we talked about what I kind of in my mind called the funeral tea, you know, those sort of points afterwards where the family gets together and, and what kind of happened during that time. And I think it's understanding how families were thinking about the tone of the event of the day and thinking about what was important, the, the, the key moments in that day, the point of committal, how people felt about that and how people felt about um, just how the whole thing, thing sort of went. And I think that's something, again, we'll come back to later. The final dis uh, deposition was really important as well. As I said the majority of the people that we talked to had cremations and um, the, the collection of the ashes afterwards and decisions that were made about what to do with the ashes were really quite important to a lot of people. Some people weren't particularly, you know, they didn't think it was particularly important to them. A lot of families spent uh, sometimes years deciding what to do with the ashes. And I think that that ritualized notion of what to do with the ashes, again, sort of fed into people's sort of satisfaction. Um, we didn't talk in huge detail about long term commemorative activity um, because we felt that was slightly outside the remit. But understanding that final act of what to do with the ashes was some, certainly something we invited people to talk about. So all the respondents we talked to talked about all of these different elements. And the first sort of thing that came out of their narrative discussion of all these elements was that the funeral service was not always the most meaningful part of the funeral. So, for example, one respondent said that he'd held his father's hand as he died, and that was that was the most important thing to him. He'd supported his then supported his stepmother through the process of decision making around the funeral service, but he regarded this as a largely functional activity that had to be gone through to satisfy the wider group of family and friends. He wasn't present when the family then later released his father's ashes into the sea. He said, I didn't actively choose not to go, but it wasn't like a massive deal to me either. For him, holding his father's hand was the important thing. So it becomes evident then that the funeral service has to be set in this wider context in order to gauge its meaning and significance. So I want to go, now, go on now and, and talk about what we found in the interviews. We did some really detailed analysis of the transcriptions and we found that overall there were five what we've, con con uh, what we've called funeral factors which made funerals meaningful. And in locating and talking about the factors, we, we've noticed a number of things along the way. So I'm going to sort of talk us through these five factors. From the outset, uh, I think you'll see as we go along, I'm going to use a lot of quotations. Um, we were very clear that we wanted to represent what people said as much as possible. If you download the report, you'll see it's full of quotations um, because people are experts in talking about their own experience. So as we go along, I'm going to use people's words as much as I can. So to start, we're going to talk about the first factor. And the first really important factor was were the person, the person who died, were their wishes known for their funeral? In some ways, the success of a funeral could be decided a long time before the funeral actually happened, when we consider the importance of people leaving wishes for what they wanted. And here I have to underline, we're not really talking about people taking funeral plans, although some people did take out funeral plans, or leaving very, very detailed information about what they wanted. It, sometimes it didn't need to be very much information at all. 
Around half the respondents that we talked to said that the person who died had left some indication of what they wanted from their funeral. And some people said that the person who died had been really very clear about the matter. So, for example, that they very definitely wanted a religious service in a particular church and sometimes with a very particular minister in accordance with their faith. Or conversely, that they very definitely didn't want a religious service and were very determined that that also would be the case. It was kind of interesting to talk to people about how that conversation came up. Um, it came up in lots of different contexts. Sometimes uh, people were talking about a funeral, but then another funeral had happened before that time. And often in families when a death take pla takes place, it, it kind of provokes people just to talk about funerals generally and what they want for themselves. And that was kind of a context for, for many people, particularly when um, an adult child is talking to their parent when another parent had already died. There's that kind of conversation that happens at that kind of juncture. Some, a couple of people had been to death planning events, which had clearly done the job of then sending them back home to say, look, I want to talk about funerals now and, and getting their family into that. And sometimes really chivying family members to say, look, we really should talk about it because it's important. Uh, but being able to leave family wishes, uh, to, to leave funeral wishes depended very much on how the person had died. Um, in some of the cases, the person who died had a long protracted illness and it was possible to talk with them about what they wanted and families were very happy about that, whether that had been possible. Um, but sometimes it was also the case that people died very suddenly or it simply wasn't the case that this was going to be um, take place, this conversation. Where people left wishes, the amount of detail could be really variable. And, um, and sometimes, but actually it didn't take much information for people to feel comforted by what was said. So one woman that we talked to was arranging the funeral of her mother-in-law. And she said, she was a very, very practical down to earth person. And her only comment was, oh, for heaven's sake, don't spend it on that, go and have a drink, just shove me in a hole. And that was about it. And so she arranged a very deliberately simple funeral for her mother-in-law. Another respondent said that her mother had been really adamant about not having a religious service. She said her father's service had been religious against the wishes, against her wishes. And it was something her mother was still really upset about. She said, I don't want anything. She said, this is the daughter talking about her mother. She said, I don't want anything. She said, I don't want any religion. I don't want any blessing the coffin and goodness knows what. She said, because it's not what I want. It's not what I believe. So then she said, I just want cremated. I don't want to go with people remembering me. So that's it. She made no other stipulations, only that it should be non-religious. What was really striking, I think, was how respondents talked about funerals where there hadn't been any last wishes to follow. The absence of last wishes often reflected the fact that sometimes people really don't want to talk about funerals. I think my husband hates talking about funerals. He's blessed with the worst wife on the planet on this regard. So he really doesn't like to talk about funerals. Some people are very superstitious about those kinds of things. They think it's morbid. Sometimes death happens in a way that there simply isn't time. Some respondents talked about older relatives who died um, in dementia and so were unable to have that conversation with them where the death died, uh, happened very suddenly or unexpectedly. One woman um, that we talked to was talking about her father-in-law, who had been a very difficult man and very difficult to have kind of straight conversations with him. He was sort of aggressively jokey about it and he wouldn't sort of say what he really wanted. And she said, in reflecting on the funeral, what was difficult about it? She said, I think the biggest worry, the biggest concern for everyone was that he hadn't actually made it clear what he wanted. So you're trying to plan the last thing you do for someone without any clue of how to do it or what their wishes are. You're picking what you think is their favourite song. You're picking all of these things, but you're doing it without their wishes. You're just hoping you're making the best choices. I think that was the hardest, not having any clues to go on. And there were two consequences, I think, where wishes weren't known. The first thing was that people were really unsure, like this woman, about whether they were getting it right or not. And I think sometimes with these things, a Christmas analogy is quite useful. It's like not knowing what somebody wants for Christmas. It's altogether nicer when somebody gives you a steer. Being unsure meant that people became anxious, they were anxious, and that's not a really good state of mind to be in on top of everything else in planning the funeral. Second, not knowing also meant that there was lots of space then for arguments and tensions about getting it right. Families could 
pull together and work together to deliver on Glass wishes. But they also fell apart a bit when those wishes weren't fully understood and people couldn't decide, didn't know how to make decisions about it. And this kind of follows on to the next factor that we think is really important that came out of the interviews as being important. And that was, was the decision making process inclusive? When um, many studies of funerals that I've, I've kind of looked at rarely give any degree of family context. We started our conversations with people very deliberately asking them about their family generally and who'd been involved in the funeral and, um, and, and how that had gone. And we, what we found was understanding the family dynamic was a really big element in getting to grips with meaning in the funeral. Families, when a death happens, families generally come together to make decisions. And we know, we all know, that families are very complicated groups of relationships that can be more or less harmonious. It was interesting in many families that actually, as a group, they kind of knew who would be good at sorting the funeral out. They kind of protected each other. So if, if um, a family member had really fallen apart emotionally after the funeral, then the rest of the family kind of stepped in to sort of help them through and to take control and to protect that person. So families were very kind of central to the decision making process. It was very rare that an individual completely on their own uh, was making those decisions um, just singly. Most um, people talked about funerals where there'd been a really concerted attempt to make sure that everyone in the family that was close to the person who died was included in some way or another. So there's a very deliberate kind of divvying out of tasks, making sure that people who wanted to spend time with the person who died was able to, that people who were, you know, great at music could come and do some musical performance, that people who were good at speaking could come and do the poem, flower arrangers could do the flower arranging, that people drew on their family skills and drew people in to making the funeral as inclusive as possible. One of the respondents who was sort of coordinating all of this activity, she said for herself, she said, throughout the whole thing, all of this arrangement that she was doing, my central message was none of this is worth falling out over. It really isn't. So I was ready to back off with anything at any stage because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. She was more concerned that this, the family would stay together and stick together and, and you know, she wasn't going to grandstand about anything. I think that was really important. But where people were really unhappy and where the funeral felt devoid of meaning was where family members the respondent themselves had been excluded from the funeral decision making processes that had been, been excluded from the arrangements altogether. Simply stated, they had other family members who took the opportunity to underline family rifts. So they used the funeral to underline family rifts to exacerbate tension. And in some cases, they simply set out to be as insensitive as possible. All the respondents who were really unhappy about the funerals they talked about were unhappy because they'd felt excluded, although they felt they also had a right to be involved. So this included one woman who'd lost her partner and where the arrangements for his funeral were made entirely by her brother, who'd stepped forward very quickly and said, I'll pay for it. But in saying that, he'd also taken all of the control of arrangements for himself. She hadn't been married to her partner, although they'd been together for 10 years. He died very suddenly, he had a stroke. The brother didn't consult with her about any of the decisions that were made. Similarly, um, we had a conversation with a mother who'd lost her son. He committed suicide. He was a teenager. Um, but she was also excluded from the funeral. All the, ex all the funeral arrangements were made by her ex-husband's new wife. And this new wife clearly didn't take any of the respondents' views into account. The mother of the, the young boy, she wanted there to be a natural burial because she saw her son in a natural setting. She saw that that was his personality, but that simply didn't happen. She wanted, she said, as far as possible, the funeral to be as natural, you know, as the powers that be. This is how she talked about her uh, uh, ex-husband's husband, husband uh, wife, as, as far as as natural as the powers that be would allow me to have. And yeah, I wasn't listened to. I didn't expect them to actually agree with, but I hope they might take some essence of that on board, but they didn't. So she was entirely excluded and the tone of the funeral was entirely, in her view, entirely wrong. So family plays a huge role. And it's clear, I think, um, that family mediation, ensuring that nobody's excluded, is one of the kind of unspoken tasks for the funeral director as they make arrangements, probably the most stressful and complicated one, and the one requiring the most skill.
And this kind of moves us on to the next factor I want to talk about. This is sort of factor number three. Was the funeral director sufficiently responsive? So it, this is a really interesting sort of question. It's kind of understanding what did people want from their funeral director? And I think it was interesting for me and one of the unexpected things that came out for me was just how experienced the people were that we spoke to. The many of the people that we spoke to, 28 of the respondents we talked to, had actually arranged a funeral before the one they chose to talk about. So by the time they were talking about a funeral, this is something that they'd done before. And they drew very much on their own experience when it came to decision making. One of the women, for example, she said, um, I've attended four funerals in the last five or six years. You learn something each time. In particular, people learn from funerals that had gone wrong. One woman was arranging her father's funeral, and this is what she said. She said, we all had memories of my mum's funeral, which wasn't very personalised, and we didn't really know how to handle ourselves. We were in shock, and it was the first family funeral that we'd attended. This time, after 16 years thinking about it, we all wanted it to be different. So people were taking their own experiences and their own um, kind of understandings into their conversation with the funeral director. They wanted the funeral director to respond to that in the right kind of way. So we know there are kind of two or three different kinds of information that people need to process around the funeral. There's basic factual guidance around logistics about fulfilling death certification, all of that kind of thing. And, and, uh, and people, you know, welcomed guidance from the funeral director to make sure all of that was right. But I think secondly, people are also looking to the funeral director for guidance in decision making around the funeral service itself and the tone of the funeral service. And I think, again, it's really difficult for the funeral director, I think, this task that they have of, of really understanding the level of guidance that families want and need. Getting it wrong. So families talked about funeral directors that get it wrong and also the funeral directors that got it right. It was interesting to have that, that contrast. Getting it wrong included offering too little guidance, but also getting it wrong could be offering too much guidance uh, and being far too prescriptive or rigid. So I think families were essentially looking for a level of co-production where they could work with the funeral director so that the funeral was right for the family, so the, funeral could the family could judge for themselves the level of involvement they were happy with. So families wanted to feel that they were themselves in charge but not every funeral director gave that impression. I think one woman particularly um, spoke of a funeral director who was very paternalistic and very clearly was speaking to her husband rather than her about her mother's death and had a very clear view about what he thought the funeral director should look like. And she found his way of working really, really difficult. And she was very unhappy with the funeral um, that took place. Another slightly more um, problematic kind of element or experience that, that came to, to the fore was one woman who talked about the death of her baby. He'd been uh, born, he'd been stillborn. And she said um, that because of the stillbirth, she was told that the funeral would be free, but any extras I would pay for. But then they didn't explain what that meant to me. So I didn't know exactly what was an extra and what wasn't. Um, so I let them guide me in what they wanted and what I definitely didn't want. And she was really clear there was one thing she was definitely didn't want to have. She didn't want a white coffin for her baby. But what they didn't really tell me is what would be the alternative. And because they were free, I didn't feel like I was in a position to question or sort of bespoke the funeral to what I wanted because I felt a bit ungrateful that they already said it was free, um, that I didn't feel as though I had the option of going away from what it was they were saying. So what this, this kind of interview kind of says to me is, is kind of degrees of agency are really important. That although this funeral director was clearly trying to be very kind in, in offering all of these services for free, um, the outcome for the, the woman that we were talking to was that she felt that she didn't have any agency or control about what was happening. So overall, what I'm, what I'm kind of saying, what we're saying is that, that people were happiest when the funeral director got their manner right got their degree of engagement right. They were responsive to the family rather than giving the family a kind of cookie cutter performance that was the same for every family that came along. That meant that sometimes the family want, might want a very functional approach. Um, we, we talked to one family who, they used the funeral director for the very minimum. They just went in, they did the pay, the funeral director with the bureaucracy and paperwork, practically everything else was done by the family. They didn't really need the, family, the funeral director very much at all. 
other cases, families could be very well, very kind of pleased when the funeral director gave them lots of options because it expanded the the possibilities for them. So the funeral director getting the getting the need right, getting that level of co-production right was really important. So that was the third really important factor, the responsiveness of the funeral director. The, the next factor I want to talk about is about contact with the body of the person who died and whether the family had the right level of contact with that body. Now, for me, this is a really interesting area, uh, which reveals lots of nuance and tension. And I think two things to be aware of before we start to get into this in detail. Engagement depended very much on how the death had taken place. And it also depended very much on an individual's attitude towards the dead body. So to talk about the first thing, I mean, I've already said a lot of people um, had um, talked about deaths that had taken place in hospital after a long and protracted illness. But also in some instances, the deaths were rather more sudden and unexpected. So people talked about deaths that had taken place suddenly following a stroke or a heart attack, somebody find um, who died in the night um, or being found dead alone at home. Oh, in one instance, somebody said that their husband had simply dropped dead in front of them. He had a massive, massive stroke. All of these hugely difficult circumstances where the immediate aftermath of the death included the ambulance service, the police and coroners. So that kind of engagement with the body then goes on a slightly different kind of trajectory. The other thing that's really important rests on... on what might be a kind of personal theology where people think about death in the body irrespective of the person who's died. For some respondents it was clear that to them the body was simply not important. To them the body's just a shell and once the death has taken the place the body's not, it, it has no significance, it's just something that, that needs to be disposed of. For them once the death had taken place there was no point really in attending to the body particularly or going to the funeral director to visit no real engagement at all so they didn't find that particularly significant and that was their preference but i think what i want to talk about is the fact that actually we've got this kind of pathway or trajectory of engagement um, when we think about people being with the body because that being with the body can happen in lots of different ways on, on this kind of pathway. And people's experiences were at different times along this trajectory or pathway. And for some of the people we talked to, the most important thing about the funeral was something that happened along this pathway and didn't relate to the funeral service at all. So I'm not gonna talk about this in detail, but I want to talk, use a couple of illustrations to talk about what I'm saying. So, for example, some people really cherished the time they spent with the person who died in the minutes and hours immediately after the death and while they were still at hospital, at hospice or at home. One woman said, um, I think this woman had gone home and uh, gone to her, her mother's house and found that her mother had died um, and she was waiting for the police and the ambulance service to come and it all took time. And she said the three hours that she spent with her mother at that time was the best three hours she ever spent with her mother because that was the only time she wasn't rude to me, she said. That was the only time she wasn't rude to me and she could actually talk to her mother without being interrupted. So that was a really precious time to that woman. People talked quite a lot about that time before the body then is taken to the funeral director and it's a kind of quite a private time for some people in, in thinking about um, being with the person who died. One of the women who talked about her baby who died very soon after being born, um, the body was retained by the hospital, the hospital because there had to be an autopsy because there was some um, investigation as to whether the hospital was culpable in the death of the, the baby. Um, so the baby's body was kept at the mortuary at the hospital and she visited every day. But she said that the, traf the staff at the mortuary treated her son, she said, as a proper human being. After he'd had the post-mortem, she said that the staff called her up. They said he'd been bathed, he'd been dressed, and they'd made him comfortable. And in her words, she said it, it felt as though the mortuary attendant, she, talk, she said her name, really appreciated who he was. So she found a huge amount of comfort in the way in which um, her son was being dealt with there. Many respondents talked about viewing the person who'd visited. So further along this, this trajectory, thinking about what happens at the funeral director's premises. Not everybody went to the funeral director to view the body because some people had already spent quite a lot of time with the body already. 
some people didn't go to the funeral directors because they'd already done that before at, at the time of another funeral they really didn't find any comfort in the experience and didn't want to repeat it so they'd try to see if they found comfort if they you know if it was if it was good for them decided it wasn't for them and they weren't going to do that again for other people they actually spent quite a lot of time with the body and this whole this, this these few days were kind of almost packed with incident there was an awful lot going on there I think it was really interesting to see how people talked about it for example one woman um, who lost her husband she went to visit her partner regularly she went sometimes twice a day and on one visit she slipped a wedding ring onto his finger they'd been planning to get married but he had a fatal stroke um, and so they weren't able to but she said she'd asked the funeral director to watch as she put the ring on his finger and in that in her mind that kind of amounted to them getting married for other people the engagement with the body at the funeral directors went really horribly wrong and perhaps one of the biggest problems was a misunderstanding about the nature of hygienic preparation some people even years later talked about how shocked they were about the fact that the body had been embalmed and they hadn't expected that that would be the case where people mentioned embalming, they always talked about it negatively. And I'm going to use a, a couple of quotations here. One woman talked about how shocked she was on seeing her father. She, she turned to the funeral director. She said, why does he look that colour and why is he so cold? And second in command said, it's because he's been embalmed. And I said, what does that mean? And he said to me, we don't discuss that. And I turned around and said, you do now start talking. So he gave me a little overview about what embalming process was. There was no mention of if you want dad embalmed or not. I didn't even know that there was something that could happen. Awful. And another woman said, I never understood what the embalming process was before. I still don't. But the first thing I'd ever say if I was planning a funeral for a member of the family is, I'd say, don't do it. Finally, a number of people arranged for the body to be brought home the day before the funeral. And that again could be a time that the family spent making the body comfortable and simply kind of being with the person in unmediated domestic surroundings. So I'll end this section on with one woman's experience. It's really interesting. She'd massively fallen out with her sisters before her mother had died and the funeral wasn't making their relationship any better, but she'd secured agreement from her sisters that her mother's body could be brought home the day before the funeral. And this is what she said. She laughed almost all the way through this account. She said, and for the first time in my life, I got on my hands and knees and scrubbed the floor. She was very particular. My mum cleanliness wise, whereas I'm not. She decided that the coffin would be on the kitchen table and that the coffin would, uh, lid would stay off. It would stay open. We had a fair few people in to come to see her, she said. She she'd told two friends who were going to stay at her house the day before the funeral. She said, look, my mum's going to be in the house. If it's off putting, you'll have to stay somewhere else. Oh, we don't mind, they said. And they were having a chat with her. And my daughter, my other daughter, and my sister's daughter, they did my mum's hair. Overall, that respondent said for her, the funeral service was immaterial. What happened after her mother's body left her home, she didn't really care about. It's just something you do, this is what she said. But the time spent with her mother at home was much, much more significant. And it was a compensation to her for the way that she'd felt excluded by her sisters from other parts of the funeral arrangements. So the final funeral director, uh, funeral factor I want to talk about then is did the funeral service meet expectations? So I think I'm going to talk a little bit about the notions of personalising a funeral. I think we need to be quite clear about the ways in which we talk about personalisation. People decided for themselves, they defined for themselves what amounted to a funeral being personalised. And there was clearly no hard and fast rules on this one. For example, one of the interviewees was um, an elderly gentleman who was very strictly um, Jewish, Orthodox Jewish, and arranged that, that service for his wife. But in his view, that service had been wholly personal because he himself had spoken and uh, written and spoken the eulogy. So in his view, it was an entirely personal funeral. Some people didn't want for the funeral to be particularly personal um, for lots of reasons. So for um, So we need to understand that being having a personal funeral was defined by different people in different ways, not always regarded as being important. But what was important was that the funeral service met expectations. 
So these expectations could be very varied, but it, the funeral service had to meet those expectations. We undertook quite a detailed deconstruction of the funeral service. We encompassed all of these different things. We talked about all of these different people. Could talk an awful lot about some things, but not very much about other things. It was really interesting. And I'm not going to go through all of these in detail. But two or three things were important. I think first in making arrangements for the funeral, families were engaged in what we might call emotional labour. It was really important for everybody to get the funeral right, much as it's important to get a Christmas present right, you might recall the analogy. And people were really pleased and proud to have laboured over, for example, choosing exactly the right music. They often talked about how complex this task was, how much time it had taken, all of the steps they'd taken to try and get the right music or deciding the right kind of flowers. You know, those kinds of decisions that the, the, the task and labor around that, people dwelt on it sometimes in a great deal of detail. People valued what they labored over the most and they labored hardest over the things that they valued. In a sense, funerals shouldn't be easy. They can't be easy because that's kind of not the point. They have to require some effort because that's the gift we give to the person who's died. So we drew three really broad conclusions about what made the funeral service important. The first thing was a good funeral service got the tone right. That doesn't mean to say that there's just one tone. In the words of one of the respondents, a good funeral is whatever you need it to be. No one wanted to be told what tone they should have. And funeral options generally fell into one of these three broad categories. Um, although religious services could be very celebratory or sombre, they could sort of fall into either of those groups. And in fact, actually, it's interesting. A lot of people said they quite enjoyed religious services. A couple of the attendants went to very religious services and they said it, there was a sense of occasion that made it, you know, that, that made it right. There was some disagreement in the respondents about whether funerals should be celebratory. But overall, a broad kind of everybody generally agreed that sometimes it was appropriate for it to be celebratory and sometimes it was not appropriate. And sometimes it was necessary for a funeral to be very sombre and that any other approach would have been wrong. For example, one of the women who lost her baby said that everybody at the funeral service found it hugely distressing and she said that was right. It was right for that to be the case. And similarly, the woman who talked about the death of her son who'd committed suicide said that everybody had found that service very, very difficult. And again, it was right for that to be the case. In other cases, celebration was felt, celebration, a celebratory tone was felt to be right, where somebody died following a long, happy, unfulfilled life. Families could judge for themselves which of those tones was the right kind of tone. Again, this factor feeds into a second element, I think, that was important about funerals, and that's the need to leave an accurate portrayal. It was considered to be hugely important for the funeral service to fit the person who died, and that all the tone, the material, non-material elements of the funeral exactly represented that person emotionally and factually. Where funerals were judged to be poor, where funeral services were judged to be poor, it's because they'd failed in this task of accurate portrayal. So one woman said, she's very critical of the funeral celebrant. It was all date, date, date. It was just like he gave accounts of my granddad's life in chronological order, but forgot to include my granddad. And this included allowing for the funeral to represent what were very difficult characteristics. For example, one family arranged for an entirely depersonalised funeral for the person who died, who'd been very emotionally abusive, a very difficult person, um, just a handful of people attended the funeral and the, the, the respondent said the family was glad that he died. They hadn't liked him. And although the celebrant had tried to introduce degrees of personalization, the family resisted it. They really didn't want to remember him at all. But also it's interesting cases where it was wrong. The whole funeral tone was wrong. And one of the respondents was, was very kind of amusing in a way. She was very wry about this particular event. And she was talking about the death of her grandfather, which she attended, but she'd actually paid for the funeral as well. So she was in a strange relationship with this particular funeral. And she was commenting on the ways in which one of the other relatives had arranged the funeral. And she said they'd got the tone entirely wrong. Her grandfather had been given a highly expensive and elaborate funeral um, and no expense had been spared. She said um, she found the whole day excruciating. She said it was just weird. 
Why is he going in the back of a horse-drawn carriage? He drove a little fiesta. Do you, get, do you get what I mean? He was a little modest guy. Why did he need all of this? It wasn't in good taste. It was terrible and it was embarrassing, especially when the cortege caused a traffic jam. So in her view, the whole thing had gone really quite horribly wrong. Finally, the funeral service was thought to be necessary to achieve closure, to allow for a final goodbye. But critically, this isn't always regarded as necessary for the family themselves but was felt to be really important for the extended family circle and for friends and work colleagues. Often the respondents that we talked to said that they'd said their final goodbye at some other juncture in this entire kind of long process. Or they continued a relationship, they never said goodbye to the person. Or they said goodbye at the point at which perhaps ashes were dispersed. So this notion of goodbye taking place at the funeral service didn't always carry for everybody. I think it's worth just saying something about this very final goodbye with the dispersal of the ashes and that for many people that we talked to who'd had a cremation was really quite important. Sometimes the disposal of the cremated remains was a very long time after the funeral service. Indeed, some people talked about the fact that it took years for them to decide what exactly they wanted to do with the ashes. And that was a time that wasn't distressing. It was, it was time for the, funeral, uh, for the families to just mull over what they would all be happy with. And then when it actually came to happen, it was happening at the right time. And I think um, one message that came out of that for me, I think, was understanding that sometimes that part of the funeral could compensate for things that had gone wrong during the formal funeral service. So, for example, one family, essentially, they reran the, the whole of the funeral service again with the ashes to make amends for the fact that the celebrant had mistakenly forgotten to member a whole, they'd forgotten to, to mention a whole branch of the family, which then caused a huge family argument that kind of like ruminated through for weeks. So they used new ritual around the funeral ashes of around the cremated remains to really sort of rebond the family together. And actions would sometimes be taken where uh, family members had felt excluded from the service. And it was interesting to see, I think, that event is a completely family-led, unmediated event. Professionals were generally not involved in that event, and people could be really active in making their own meaning about how they disposed of cremated remains. So I'm going to come coming to an end now, and I'm going to sort of end with, with just a handful of kind of selected messages, I think. Perhaps the key thing for me was the importance of funeral wishes and the importance of funeral wishes in giving families something to bond over and to um, avoid that sort of trap of falling out when funeral wishes aren't, haven't been articulated. There is something around funerals and the notion of gifting that, that often funerals are a gift to the person who's died, that families are gifting something back to that person and gifting back by meeting somebody's wishes can be very comforting for families and I think that articulation is very clear if you kind of look at the report. A second thing is around people spending time with the body. Sometimes people found it really comforting and sometimes they didn't. Um, at the moment there's a movement towards the concept of direct cremation which is a really interesting kind of development but I think there's one thing about it which is that it might remove people's opportunity to decide if they think if they might find it comforting to be with the body because it takes that opportunity away and and we know that where people did find comfort and meaning in it it was something that they remembered very warmly still for years later that they'd had that time with the person that had died um embalming is really interesting to see how people could be very distressed by embalming particularly where it had taken place without express and informed content i think it's clear that if funeral directors don't think it's appropriate to discuss the details of hygienic treatment for fear of causing upset, then clearly they know it's not a process that their clients will find comforting. So I think we need to sort of say a little bit more about or think a little bit more about um, embalming and, um, and people really being um, very much distressed by that if they, if they haven't actively consented to it. The funeral service was for the most it, whilst it was a significant event for many people that we talked to, sometimes isn't the most meaningful aspect of the wider funeral. And I think that for me means that all the death care professionals that are involved in the task um, are, are, are implicated in this task of making meaning and drawing comfort. So if we recall kind of the mortuary staff and their approach to dealing with that small baby, 
how much comfort the family drew from that kind of intervention and that sort of ritual activity about around making the baby comfortable thinking about the stuff that are on the wards particularly just a few moments after the death and making space for the family to be with the person that have died the funeral director is not the only person that who's in charge of making meaning not the only professional involved in making meaning um, along this extended trajectory and I think finally, and this is kind of where I want to end, is that I think we should be really careful about being prescriptive about where people should find meaning within kind of funeral ritual. Funeral ritual. The study found that people were, were able to locate meaning. They found meaning in very, very many different ways. You know, it was, it was hard to sort of generalise about the point at which that's, that's the point at which it was important. But also at the same time as that, we need to sort of acknowledge that families over time, and this is sort of inevitable, over time we become more experienced at funerals, you know, our grandparents die, our parents die, that families that we were talking to were, increased, were becoming increasingly expert at understanding what worked for them. So families themselves could be quite expert at kind of understanding how to derive meaning from funerals. And um, I'm really pleased that that study gave me the opportunity of learning from that expertise. So I'm going to end at that point. Thank you very much but I'll put the report up there.